Sarah's work in the program, for the students in the audience, who we are, um, and why I curated her work in the show and brought her to talk about it. So regarding book arts, why is architectural studies majors to look at artist books? Putting aside a longer discussion about the breadth of all the design that we include under um, architectural studies as this big umbrella, if we just compare books and buildings, books are not unlike buildings. They have basic structures, a spine, they have facades, covers, a bunch of information inside to navigate through, some sort of interior landscape. They have narrative, and so do buildings and design spaces. They are places that are occupied, at least mentally and physically interacted with. They push us around and we push them around, not unlike design spaces. So artist books are art in the medium of the book. By their very nature, artist books say to onlookers, do you really know what a book is? Maybe you don't. And I think this is particularly good as a question to pose in the classroom with students. Part of becoming a designer is learning to question the how and why the world has been designed the way it is, how ordinary objects might be learned from, um, dosed with some sort of creative process, remade and rethought, even if none of those creative recastings come to fruition. Which brings me to my second point, why bring Sarah in particular. Sarah makes beautiful books. Highly crafted, elegant, thoughtful, provocative meditations in book form. But just as valuable for students to see is the process Sarah goes through in designing and producing an artist's book. You will see in her talk that process is important to Sarah, that no decision she's aware of is left to chance. And there's a lesson in here for all of us. To see an artist pursue an idea, but let the idea solidify through the process. I personally believe that this is what all great work develops from, and something all of us in architectural studies make sense of toward teaching. Sarah Burkind is a letterpress printer and bookbinder specializing in the production of editioned artist books under her imprint, Big Jump Press. These books have been featured in exhibitions around the United States and have been acquired by special collections libraries internationally, including at Yale, Harvard, the New York Public Library, and the Darling Bio Medical Library at UCLA. In 2011, Bryant won the MCBA Prize for her book, Biography, which is out of the gallery she's going to talk about. Brian has taught book arts courses for the University of Georgia, the University of Alabama, in the book arts program, and at Wells College, where she was the Victor Honor Fellow from 2008 to 2011, and we became fast friends. She teaches bookbinding and letterpress printing workshops around the U.S. and in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Sarah Brian.
pace that they're going to take as they kind of move their way through uh, your, your work. The sequence is something that you're controlling. You're showing them information in order. You know, and that information can take the form of text or images in, in a lot of different forms. But you are given this wonderful opportunity to use time. You're showing them things in order. You're presenting them an idea. And you can really enhance that idea by using the layout of the page, by putting things in one position on one page and something else in the same position on the other page so that you're replacing something. It's almost like an animation movie that has a lot in common with other time-based forms. So you can see in this case, all of these cards can be pulled out, they can be put back in. This is just something that can't happen if you're dealing with something flat, something that happens in a moment, like a print or painting. And of course, those things have you know, a lot of wonderful qualities that books don't possess, but this is how they're different. This is why we make the choices that we do when we think about what to make. This book uh, was about, well, dissecting dissecting places and people and social anxieties. Again, this is something that couldn't be possible without the book form. You need to have the manipulation of those pages to peel things apart and have a look and read the text and then look at the text when you see it layered on top of other texts. These things just can't happen if they weren't in a book. Impossible. So, the other thing I wanted to say is, what, before I get started, is why talk about process at all. What's so, what's so important about the process? And I talk about process a lot these days. I, I go around and I talk about the books, giving kind of an idea through printing and production to a lot of different people. And I have a blog, which is what's here showing the process of designing a particular print that was related to this last book that I produced. And I mean, I guess there is something, there's something related to vanity and talking about process because you're devoting a lot of your time to this project. And it's important to, to show it and acknowledge that it isn't just a book that came out of a, a desktop printer and got glued together. But it's also, the process informs the content, the design. It's, it's not as if I have an idea, make a thumbnail sketch, and then just automatically produce 75 books that are exactly what my great idea was. I, it goes through a lot of changes. Some of those changes are critical. Something that seems like a great idea in your head as a book soon completely deteriorates when you start putting it together and having a look. Uh, it mostly deteriorates. Most of what I produce, I end up you know, throwing in the garbage or, or saving and putting in a gallery when I get to talk about process, which is a real bonus. Um, but the other thing about process, and I, I don't know if any of you listen to Radio Lab. I think some of you maybe do. Um, they, uh, Robert Krolich, who's just a charming, charming radio man, um, and Jad Numra, they have a show where they talk all about science. Science, science, science. They tell hilarious stories. There's a lot of high production value in the radio show. And they talk about science in a way that everybody can appreciate science. And Robert Krolich gave a commencement speech, I think at Caltech a couple years ago. You can listen to it. I did. And he talks to all of these scientists about telling stories. He says, you have to tell the story to people that don't understand. You can't talk just to your colleagues. You need to talk to people that don't know anything about what you're doing, because that's how you inform, and that's how people give value to what you're doing. There's no way for me to explain a book just by showing a finished product. I mean, a lot of people don't know anything about book art. I imagine maybe there's a couple of you who don't know all that much about it. And if I just stand here and show you a book, you will have no idea exactly what goes into producing that book. So informing people about what the design process is and how long it takes to put these things together is important. So telling a story. I think is important for all of us, no matter what we're doing. So I think process is important for that reason. So, la la la, we're going to get started now. So these are the two books that I'm talking about today. The first on the top is called Biography, which is a book about the periodic table of elements, uh, the elements in the human body, and what else the elements in the human body do. A few of you here have already heard me talk 
like way too much about this book. You have to bear with me for the first you know, 15 minutes or so, but then we'll get to the new stuff, I promise. Uh, the second book is Fond, which is a book I just finished, honestly, just before I came over here. I live in England, and I flew over in at the end of October, early November, and I was binding this book practically on my way to the taxi to, get, to go to the airport, so it's very, very new. And this book is about the objects that we collect, the valueless objects, the, I don't know, the keys that don't work anymore, the rocks you pick up at the beach, all that kind of stuff. We all have that stuff, and none of it has any value, and if you were to see someone else's pile of stuff, you wouldn't think twice about throwing it in the garbage, but for some reason we keep it, we collect it, and we move with it, and we put it in boxes, and put it on our bureaus, and we just can't bear to part with these things, and I thought, that is what I would read this book about. But both of these books started the same way. They're very, very different projects, but they both started with this idea of collections of things. And it's interesting to me that I can't that I I can't let go of the collections and that I've made one book and I thought I was finished, and then I made a whole other project basically about the same thing. Um, so I'm gonna talk about biography first which began when I was teaching um, in Italy. And I was just looking at a lot of different um, collections, as I said. Garbage on tabletops, um, collected, collected things, collected things. You know, why these, why these doorknobs are all in the same place after they've obviously had a life somewhere else. So I was thinking about those things, and that is where this book began. And I was also thinking, it's a bit silly to stand here in an architecture department talking about architecture, about which I know literally almost nothing, but I was taking a lot of photographs of buildings and facades and moments where these buildings had changed in some way, where a window had, had been bricked up in one spot and was now in a new spot, doors that were gone but standing next to this bricked up wall that was a new door, and then moments where these bits of text were being reused, which I really found pretty delicious. And the collections and the buildings, they had something in common for me. And I wasn't sure why. And so I just started taking those photographs, thinking a lot about that stuff, and just making things, making anything, making garbage. This is a, a uh, calculation wheel. I, it's hard to see, really, but a calculation wheel is one of those things where you have different information visible at different times. You turn a little wheel. I thought, oh, how fun. I'll do that. But in the end, it was garbage. This is uh, me just using periodic shaped stuff to make periodic shaped things, but you know it wasn't going anywhere. But if you don't move your hands, you don't go. You know, you, your your hand and your brain they're connected. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can finish without doing both. So working digitally, working with paper, putting things into book form. Because I work in book form, all of my early drafts by their very nature, have to be in book form. Because so much about a book is about that experience of turning the page. You know, how it feels to see one thing and peel the layer over and see something else. Those, it is very detailed how you make these relationships between pages. And you can't do it just by looking at a laptop and doing things with a pencil. So here's another piece of garbage that I decided to discard. You know, I'll take this book, I'll make a Board book, cards, I just love pulling cards out, that's for sure. I can't stop doing it, but in the end, I weaned myself off of it. Uh, and making prints at the same time, thinking about using the print as, as a sketch as well. So working three-dimensionally, working on the press, and just seeing what kind of ideas shake out while I do all of that stuff. This was the beginning of that book. It was here when I saw the periodic table form and the uh, elements in the human body is something that I could work with. And something that I think was telling the same story as all of these collections. The idea of different pieces being recombined in different ways and then creating a new thing. And then disseminating again and recombining and disseminating and recombining. And I thought that is the way I can talk about collection. That is the way that I can talk about reuse. So that's what this book came from. You have to do a lot of research, you know, if you're talking about chemistry and you make books for a living, there's just no way to make a book about it without talking to some people who really know a lot more than you do. And if you try to do it without talking to that person, you're just going to end up in deep trouble. So I made an appointment with a chemistry professor. I was teaching at Wells at the time, Christopher Bailey. 
and we sat down and he was so nice to me and explained all kinds of things and I don't remember it, but I do um, remember what I took away, which was, you know, these are the elements I want to use, this is how I'm going to figure this out. I made a lot of flashcards, I put them on the table and I just got to work doing a lot of doodling and drawing. Oh, I should also say, these, I have the early drafts of this book here, and I just love to pass them on. So if you guys would like to take a stack and just take it upon yourself to... Some of them are better than others, you know. Some of them have coffee on them. Some of them are uh, more finished. So once the ideas start to come together, then it's time to design in earnest um, what was once the, you know, door to your... I don't know, kitchen, um, soon, soon you're focusing those ideas and just working very hard to get, to get them down, to kind of nail down what you want to say. For me, I wanted to create a series of diagrams about the elements, where they go, what they do. So elements and what, um, what tools we make out of them, what weapons we make out of them, what their concentration is in seawater. And when you're designing stuff like this and creating this sort of imagery or this sort of diagram, all of the, all of the details are critical. So, worked very hard, not just to get the ideas down, but to get them down in a way that, that made sense, that worked with the rest of the book. There, you know, the grid on one page had to line up with the grid on another page. There's a lot of just thinking, and a lot of agony, and a lot of time hunched over a laptop, giving yourself carpal tunnel while you get all of the lines to go in the right place. And of course here, these are the mock-ups that you're now looking at. Every time I fiddle with the design digitally, you can't just leave it that way. You have to print it out, put it together, and make sure that when it's actually a physical object, that it still makes sense. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about printing later when I talk about the other book, but it's enough to say that it's one color at a time, one page at a time. So 20 colors take a long time. But if you need 20 colors, that's kind of what you have to do. There's a lot of patience involved with everything that's worth making, and this is no exception. There's that guy. And there's that book. There, how about that? That was the quickest I've ever talked about that book in my life. <laughs> Zoom through it, but I did want to talk about it because, as I said, this book came out of the same soup that the other book came out of. And here we are again, collecting. You know, you finish a project, you spend two years making it, and you think, at last, I'm free. I would like to make a book about butterflies or, I don't know, something else. But then I'm taking, collect taking collection photographs again. And the photographs, I should say, are the beginning of the process. It's like how to find out what you're secretly interested in. You don't really answer that question honestly to yourself because they say, oh, I'm interested in the other cars. But that's not what I'm interested in, apparently. I'm interested in just junk that's hanging around on a table. So here I am again, this time taking pictures of objects that have not a lot of value. So I'm, I'm in the Diffie Museum somewhere in the UK, and it's like, there's some shells. Okay, they're on the, they're on the wall. And then here, fragments of a lead window frame. I don't know, maybe I'm in the wrong room. It's possible that there's some people here that are like, oh, oh, oh fragments of a lid, window frame, what, what thrilling material for me. I mean, I'm in this museum and I'm just thinking, what is, who cares about fragments of a lid, a lid window frame? But I like it, I took a photo of it. Oh, so I started thinking about those things. I started thinking about the valueless things, the rocks, the pebbles, and taking photos of just groups of objects, you know, groups of stones, and then arranging those stones in a particular way. So this was one thing that was happening in my head, was this valueless stuff. But there were also a couple of other things going on. One was, I was, I was trying to make, I wanted, you know, while I was just taking photos of lead window frames, I was thinking, I'm going to make a book about how we make decisions. I want to look at the, the heuristics, those kind of social psychology heuristics that we learn about where you're using these shortcuts in your brain that um, help you to make decisions. That's how, you, how your brain works, I guess, or how your brain works when I was studying social psychology, whatever that was. We probably have a whole new model now that I didn't know. So I'm working on this. 
oh, this is so fascinating, the anchoring heuristic, how we decide which piece of information is valuable. And I thought, this is what my next book is going to be. It's going to be about how we make decisions, and that's the kind of text I'm going to use. And then at the same time, the third thing I was thinking about was not anything I thought was going to be a part of Big Jump Press, which is my press name. I, I was just taking dippy photographs on vacation and sending them to friends because I thought it was hilarious. Look at my blue car. Look at everywhere it can go. It can go to the dock. It can go on the, you know, the terrain. But pretty soon I started just taking photographs of that car just all by itself. And then I also started taking photographs of other things all by themselves. And before I knew it, I was making a book about those things. Not the heuristics, not the, not the kind of dry dis description of how we make decisions. I still wanted to make that book. It was agony, kind of slowly letting go of it. And I don't know, maybe it will come back. But it, I was just kind of dominated by these objects. And, you know, how the, the real problem of a book about your own stuff, right, is who cares about your stuff. I, I mean, I don't care about David. David, I don't care about your rocks and stuff. I just don't care about it. So why do I get to make a book all about my stuff and then sell it to libraries? You know, how is that possible? So I try, I'm trying so hard to think about, you know, I'm trying to get away from making a book about my own stuff, but at the same time, I'm just possessed by it and I can't stop. So I started creating this kind of rope of narrative about each of these objects and where they came from and how I picked them up and maybe why I hung on to them so long and trying to create something, I don't know, very, like a sinew, you know, a sinew that comes just, of, just out of the narratives of these things. But I was still trying to squeeze some other things in. Why this is about people moving, decision making about moving. I was doing a lot of reading still about decisions, thinking I'm going to squeeze decision making into this book. I'm going to make it about that, even if it's about my object. But, uh, and of course, here I am, as I did with the last book, just making mock-ups, making mock-ups the whole time. Even when I knew it was kind of trash or the beginning, I thought, this will be, I will know better what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong if I can page through a book. I need the three-dimensional object, and I need the time. I need the time to move through it and see what happens page to page. So here we are. And at this point, it's already getting very close to what the book ended up looking like. Even though I, it took me so long to finally decide just to give up and say, yes, I will make this book. Give up on science. <laughs> so I, I started photographing more of my stuff. If the book was going to be about my stuff, then let's pick the stuff, you know. Let's pick 10. 10 is a nice natural human number. I will pick 10 of my objects, and I will pick up that nut on the hill. I don't know how fascinating that is. And then they're yawning by page two. I don't care where the clothespin came from. I don't care. I wanted to make my narrative be a part of this book, but I wanted to obscure that with something else. I wanted to obscure it with something about why anyone would pick up these things, or what, you know what their relationship is to these objects and to their own objects. And so, as I often do, I turn to reference material. Books have this natural relationship with reference anyway. So a lot of the books that I make end up having text that is coming in some way from indexes or indices. And, uh, uh, the, like the, it, the index, for example, the skeleton book has an anatomical index along the side. Cutaways, a lot of dictionary text that I changed and moved. And so I, I went back to it to see if I could find some definitions that would get my mind moving and give me some language that I could use that would be more broad than just my own things and where they came from. So I started looking at text, like, you know, what is a relic? What is a token? What is a souvenir? How do we actually classify and define these things? An object. And I found the text that I thought was appropriate to include, you know, all of us in our habits with objects. And so I decided to print the text that, that's more kind of abstracted definitions in black, in my own text, my own sort of acknowledging that I do have a personal history with these 
objects in gray. But it all combines in a way that makes it illegible eventually, which is intentional. I wanted to create this sinew, this, the idea that we pick these objects because something about the combined narrative of all of these things gives us some idea of ourselves and what, what our, how we consider ourselves. I think the objects that we choose sometimes have a relationship with how we want to remember and what we choose to remember. So I expand the text out at the end to kind of offer some kind of explanation why we keep these things. And once the text was resolved, it was time to, or I should say simultaneously, there are a lot of just practical considerations about how to present the imagery in this book. How do I want to view the objects? Do I want to view them from the side, from above? I tried it from the side. I even ordered printing plates for it. But the shadow was so distracting in the book. It, it, it was just too distracting. I think, no, well, I can't go back. I just can't go back. But anyway, backwards. Backwards. I think I was wrong. Yeah, do you, see, do you see the shadow here of the fork? I mean, it just doesn't fit. I, I didn't like it at all. I didn't want this to feel like a space that things were sitting. I wanted to be kind of looking from above at them or have them kind of outside of place for the book. Um, this is a digital design, and things change on the press, but this is where I kind of started. So here we are, looking at the objects, looking at them from above and below. I thought perhaps I wanted to have some pages that have the front of the car, and then as you turn in the exact position, you have the back of the car. I thought about that for a while, and in the end, I discarded it because I thought it was unnecessary. But I spent, it doesn't mean I didn't spend like hours, just hours working on that side of the project. And I just, I think with anything, you have to just discard things when they're not working, even if it, even if it hurts you to your very core you have to get rid of that stuff. And then it's time for the boring stuff, like, how I have to cut out this shape in Photoshop. I'm going to spend an hour in Photoshop just, you know, and I'm not an expert in Photoshop. And if anybody here knows some easier way to do this, I do not want you to tell me because it's <laughs> too late. You know, the hours are gone. We're just going to just don't, never tell me. Never. <laughs> Give me your card. I'll call you next time when I have something that I don't want to know. But so, right, everything has to be, has to be, Cutting it out, I didn't want it to look jagged and strange. I wanted it to look natural, just like the object itself. Oh, that's another mock-up. I wanted to have, uh, I wanted to have an appendix. I wanted to have the appendix because I wanted to have a place for those objects to actually sit uh, with a kind of dry description of where they came from, what they were made of, what year I picked them up. Just somehow seemed appropriate to me. Ah, but to do that, this is goofy, but to do that, to get the weight, I didn't have a scale, so I had to fake it at the post office. <laughs> it's funny to just, <laughs> it's silly to talk about it at all in a talk, but I was just so pleased, when I, and I hate my postmistress now, she's so rude, and I just walked up and I was like, I'm going to mail these tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just going to wait this now, I'll be back. <laughs> So once all of that was done, it was time to just order the paper. Paper, by the way, is really expensive. So if you're making a book, you better be ready to buy hundreds of dollars worth of paper. I think this was, this is UK too, so everything is more expensive. So this is like a million, this is like 300 pounds, which roughly translates to a million dollars. <laughs> um, order the printing plates. Now, I should say now that, uh, I know that, you guys don't have printing facilities here. However, there is an excellent resource here in the neighborhood, which is the Cracker Factory, or Three Stories, where they have three beautiful letterpress machines, one of which is mine. And uh, they're, te yeah. Yeah. But, uh, they're, teach they're starting to teach some workshops there now. And I am teaching one on Friday, so you know, keep your eyes open on stuff like that. But this is how these uh, books were printed from polymer plates, which are plastic material. They're exposed with a negative. They sit in the bed of the press, and I printed them. Oh, look, an illustrated guide. How convenient it was. This is the kind of press that I use. Um, <laughs> labels 
are, are there you know, for your pleasure. But I won't go into it too much except to say that. I used to have a video when I gave a talk like this, but it would work absolutely never at the time. So <laughs> I started using just this amazing animation. Look at that. Paper goes over the plate. Bang! There it is. There it is. So just this before, one color at a time, one page at a time. I'm printing the film canister. The color of the objects is really important. I wanted everything about the objects to be um, very real. Um, the, the book is, it, it would make no sense to have the objects be out of scale, to have the colors be wrong, so I spent an awful lot of time making sure that I was printing them exactly the size that they are, and that the color uh, matched. So I used my Pantone guide, and mixed the color, and then I saved the color so that whenever I used you know, that color later, I know I don't have to remix this really, really persnickety brown color for the nut shape or the car or yellow. And then, then there are these horrible things for a letterpress printer or for anyone who cares like an awful lot about what they're doing, where you print something because and you didn't wash the press well enough and so it's pink there, you know? I throw stuff like that away. I don't I don't want it to be pink. I want it to be gray, and it's not gray. I'm not going to hand that book to someone and say, oh, just pretend like that's gray. You know, it's gray or it's not gray. So here's the beginning of the book coming together, slowly, slowly. I thought initially that I wanted to have half tones, half tone photographic images of the objects wherever they were in the book. But very quickly, I, I fell in love with the idea of only having the silhouette in the color that the shape, you know, in the color of the shape or the object. And so I left it that way. I printed the half tone in the appendix where it seemed appropriate, kind of laying out of all of the information, the pertinent information to the project. But the, this moment, I wanted it to be um, less specific, just like the text was less specific right there. And because the where I'm not using any ink at all, and partly I wanted to, this project is also about disseminating the objects. I, I bound the, the books together, some of them, with the objects themselves, and I'm slowly se selling them, discarding them, putting them somewhere else, and so the kind of idea of the presence and absence of them was something I wanted to acknowledge in the book. Slow printing process, printing, 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 the appendix. Uh, and I'm in a shared studio right now because my press is here. And uh, when you're in a shared studio, you, well, you better wrap that stuff in plastic before you go away because you just never know who's going to wander over with a cup of coffee and ruin years of, or months of work. This is the bus stop where I left some prints. <laughs> I just have to say that happened. And it, it never came back. I left. So, on to the binding. So, while I'm printing this book, the design of the book is the design not just of the content, but also of the, the housing, the structure, the binding. Uh, and those things are related. The content impacts the binding, or should, and the, the binding certainly impacts the content. So, if you're made, you could make a fantastic, beautiful, well thought out book and, and just put it together like a mess, and no one is really going to pay much attention to what you're trying to say. Unless, I mean, of course, if you're making a book about a big mess, then make it a messy book. But if that's not the point, you better watch out. So I spend a lot of time working on the binding while I'm working on the printing. And in this case, I thought I wanted to use Buckram, which is a library, which is like you see theater back there just going blue. Buckram is a, uh, is a library binding material. It's a uh, it's a sort of plasticky feeling thing. It's durable. You know, if you spill something wet on it, it'll survive. You know, but and I thought, oh gosh, how delicious and fun! I will make this book about objects and archives and collections, and I will bind it in buckram. And nobody does that. It'll be hilarious. I will be the queen of books. And I just really was so in love with the idea of this buckram. I ordered rolls of it. I thought this is just going to be. <laughs> Nancy's just like, oh, why did you do that? But I did, and then I made this, you know, and it just looks like hell. I, it's not the right thing, you know. You can try all you want to make a little joke about Buckram, but you, when you're actually trying to make a beautiful book and then sell that book, you know, maybe you better 
maybe you better think again. You know, uh, this is, you know, book to book, making a lot of it's just small decisions. The width of the board, the width of the spine piece, you know, the color, all, all these things. Every single mock-up, even though it takes a long time, is just a mock-up. So, you know, I'm, I'm ready to make a lot of changes when I'm designing the binding. Oh, and I thought I would show you a lovely picture of the yellow book cloth that I ended up choosing, but it's back here. You can see. Uh, and in fact, I will go ahead and pass this book around too. This is the finished version of Fun. Nancy, do you mind if I pass? No, it's fine. Here's the finished version of the biography and the finished version of Fun. So I'll just send these along on the way as well. So in the end, I chose this lovely yellow cloth, which um, I'm, I'm very happy about. It. I, uh, I don't feel, I don't miss the book room at all, I'll just say. I don't miss it. And then it was time to find. So, a lot of folding. A lot of folding and collating and organizing. This book is bound uh, as a drum leaf, which uh, is what I'm teaching tomorrow. I don't know if any of you are taking that workshop here, but the beauty of a drum leaf is that you can, you can make a book where the opening page, this opening area is one sheet of paper. So other kinds of binding, this is impossible. You have multiple sheets of paper folded around themselves. So if you cut that book up, you would maybe have on one sheet of paper, page one and page, I don't know, 16. That probably wouldn't happen, but you know what I mean. All mixed up. This binding, I can print what I will see. And I really value that when I'm making books that have a lot of stuff happening across the gutter. I'm using that whole area. So the, the drum leaf was a very important structure. If I wasn't making a book like this, I wouldn't use this, this binding. Cutting lots of teeny little labels, lots of little labels, getting the books together, and then there they are, without their boxes. I, I also make boxes for many of my books, just as I protection and also it's part of the design of the book as a housing. And there it is. The project uh, was about making a book, but I also wanted to make a set of prints. Uh, I, I wasn't I thought I was done with the objects, but I wasn't ready to let go. And so I made for every object I made one print using text from the book. And this is the beginning of the closed bin causes someone to remember something print. And there it is. The pine cone is an object of veneration. I used only, or for the most part, there were some times when I decided to break my own rule, but I used only the objects themselves for the imagery in these prints. So for the object is, or the pine cone is an object of veneration. You see I'm making this kind of wild kind of halo out of the clothespin. And there's only one clothespin printing plate. So that was one pin printed 15 times, which is certainly kind of a meditative activity. Um, and oh, I just wanted to say one little thing about this one is you, I had like the greatest plans in the world for this print. I had this one orange-ish, Clothes pin there that I really wanted to have, and I thought it would be very nice and it would look very beautiful. But as soon as I put it on the page, it looked like that to me. <laughs> and I thought, no, no, I do not want this. It wasn't right. So I got rid of that idea and I changed it, again, using the kind of blind impression. And there it is. The key is the blue um, sort of label around. Here's the broken key has survived the passage of time. The film is an indication of something else. And the prints were also an opportunity for me to use some things. But when, when you're printing, you're constantly creating a lot of waste sheets. So I'm, I, I use paper to check the amount of ink, to check the position. I'm constantly using the same sheets over and over and over again. So all kinds of wacky things get layered on top of other things. It has absolutely no relationship to the book in reality, but it means that there are a lot of like happy accidents, which is what this was. This was a happy accident that happened at some point while I was printing, where the key landed right inside the film canister, right on top of a blind impression of the pine cone, and I thought, oh, oh my goodness. And so I 
I, I did it. I did it on purpose later. I use the things that are accidents and I select. And so I, I included this in the print. <coughs> Uh, I designed a deluxe edition for this project, and the deluxe edition of this book is uh, unlike this, the book that's going around which just has a slipcase. I wanted to create an entire box that housed the, the project, so the book, the prints, and each one of ten of these copies of the book would have one of the objects um, enclosed in a little, in a little uh, box. So it was really important to me to kind of spend a lot of time trying to work time trying to work out how that was going to happen. So this was an early draft of that deluxe edition, but it ended up looking much different. Or you know, different. And uh, it takes a lot of it's very fussy doing all this finicky box stuff. But you can see there's the nut nestled in this little red box. I'm staying with Kieran and Jeffrey right now, and they have a whole bowl full of these chestnuts. And I just walked by and went, what? <laughs> How do you have so many? <laughs> <laughs> like they grow on trees. I know, I'm going to just put some in my pocket and start the next book. So here's the finished deluxe edition with the prints. And there they all are. Um, and here's this again. Just to say, I, do, I document all of this stuff repeatedly all the time. If you are interested in learning more about how the presses work, you can find it on my blog, or you can see this entire process go in much greater detail than today, because I know you're just dying for more. So that's, uh, that is that. So that's all I'm going to say right now. I will happily take questions, and I would love for us to maybe go to the um, other room and look at the uh, materials. Yeah. Uh, you, were, you said you were leaving the like, seminar for the PGA and doing that uh, binding. So, oh yes, I am. Yeah, I'm doing that for uh, uh, four, two, one o'clock to five o'clock, four thirty tomorrow. Yeah. What is it? One four thirty. And there's still some spaces. Isn't there? No. There's no. <laughs> but I can always leave a kit and some handouts. No. So if we're interested, yeah. <laughs> sure, <sound. laughs> No, I'll leave some materials around. So the instructions will be here, and there will be at least 13 people wandering around who have learned how to make them. Make them pick Including right. Professor Zabrowski and myself. Great. <laughs> uh, if, there any, if there are no other immediate so questions, I say we should go to the other room, and you can paw through the uh, process stuff for fun. No problem.